Hi, my name is Julia McClendon, and I have the honor of being the CEO of the YWCA Elgin. First, we'd like you to know we are gathered in the Grove Room at the Gail Borden Public Library. All of us in the room have been vaccinated, are practicing social distancing, and have taken off our masks. Mary Camacho, who's also on our panel, will be in the admin fishbowl participating from there tonight. We also are thankful for the staff who are the social media specialist, <laughs> Laura Espinoza, Annalise Homeyer, and Natalie Keberg. Keberg who are working behind the scenes with technology expertise to make the program happen. You guys, thank you. They're in the room here with us running around trying to make us be quiet. So, <laughs> uh, it is our honor to partner with Gail Borden Public Library in order to take a step back in the history of the YWCA Leader Luncheon during Women in History Month. We've always been inspired by the women in the community and their contributions. In 1984, the YWCA Elgin began recognizing women leaders in our community who motivate us all. Tonight, our panelists include Donna Anderson, Betty Brown, Mary Camacho, Myrna Hanseman, Dr. Claire Oleas and Nancy Schooneman. All have been involved in this community and have worked so very, very hard to keep the YWCA Elgin Leader Luncheon going strong for 37 years. Uh, Nancy Schooneman will start the program with a little bit of the history of the YWCA and Dr. Oleas We'll talk about the YWCA Elgin Leader Luncheon and how it began. Of course, each of the awards have a namesake and we will share a little bit about each person and hear from some of the women who have been a recipient. So it's time to start the program, Nancy. Thank you, Julia. We're so pleased to be here at the Gail Borden Library to speak about the YWCA and its signature event, the annual Leader Luncheon, which is now beginning its 38th year of honoring women for their outstanding achievements in eight different categories. This event will be held virtually for the first time on Thursday, May 13th at six o'clock PM. And it's going to be absolutely free. Just check the YWCA website for more details. Tonight, you'll be hearing much from us about past Leader Luncheon Individual Award recipients and the incomparable women who are the namesakes of the awards. But first, I think it's important, especially during Women's History Month, to go back in time to the very beginning of the Young Women's Christian Association in Elgin. Our association came about because of fearless women leaders in the community who when they recognized a problem or saw a need, were not afraid to step up and do the legwork necessary to offer solutions that would make a positive difference for others. In the early 1900s, many young girls were flooding into Elgin in search of employment in business and industry. They came from small towns and farms in search of work, and they did find positions at the shirt factory, the shoe factory, the milk condensing plant, and the National Watch Company. Most of these girls had never been away from home before and knew no one here. They found housing, but it was often in rundown boarding houses or rooms rented from families, from total strangers actually, affording them little contact with others. 
at this time, Hattie Griffin, one of the namesakes for the Individual Award for Education, was a teacher, a position she held for over 50 years, and the principal of the Lincoln School here in town. She often saw these young ladies aimlessly wandering the streets of Elgin with what she described as a rather forlorn look on their faces and a sadness in their eyes. She saw a need. She knew that it was important for them to have a safe place to gather socially. And she took the lead in organizing a young women's Christian association in 1901. The first physical and social activities took place in the gymnasium of the Elgin Watch Factory. Any woman of good moral character could join for a one-time fee of just a dollar. Hetty Griffin continued to look for a more permanent meeting place and was approached by Mrs. A.B. Church who donated a lot and a house on Chicago Street for just this purpose. This caught the attention of other women leaders, prompting Julia Peck, who was a great fundraiser at the First Congregational Church, to organize a group of women who set out, many on horseback or a horse and buggy, to raise money needed to renovate that old house. Things took kind of a different turn though, when she went to visit David C. Cook, who said to her, Mrs. Peck, I will not give you a penny towards the renovation of that old house. However, if you will construct a more sturdy brick building to replace that house, I pledge to you $1,000. Well, there was no question that this was the direction to take. And so Mrs. Peck continued on her journey to now attempt to raise about $30,000 for the construction of a building. She met with great success until she went to visit local philanthropists, Mr. and Mrs. George P. Lord, who had contributed handsomely towards the construction of a YMCA. She was turned away by Mrs. Lord, who said to her, girls will be good anyway. It's those boys we need to worry about. The couple, after a visit from Hattie Griffin, again, reconsidered and did make a sizable donation, allowing for the construction of the YWCA to begin. The building opened in 1906, complete with meeting rooms and lounges with a gymnasium and offices and a wonderful cafeteria that not only employed women, but also was profitable and allowed the agency to raise the funds necessary to add on a swimming pool, which opened in 1913. I'm gonna jump ahead to the mid 1930s when Marie Grolick, the namesake for social service was general secretary of the YWCA. During her tenure, several women's organizations took roots in the YW, including the Newcomers Club, the Elgin Junior Service Board, and the Business and Professional Women's Club. Many of these women who were leaders in these particular groups have been nominees and honorees at leader luncheons through the years in various categories. On Thanksgiving Eve, November 27, 1963, the then 57-year-old YWCA building was destroyed by fire. But once again, the resilient women and girls of the YWCA set off on a campaign to raise the funds needed to replace the facility. Within just two years, they not only reached but exceeded their goal of $750,000. And the new building was occupied in stages between 1965 and 1966. This is the same building with many renovations that is still in use today at 220 East Chicago Street. And just like 120 years ago, the YWCA board, volunteers, staff, committee members, reach out to the good people of the Elgin area, offering vital services and programming like that was 
which was begun by Hetty Griffin and Marie Grolick and Julia Peck and so many other um, women leaders. So what could be more appropriate than the YWCA sponsorship of an event that recognizes and honors women who have contributed to making their community better? And now, Claire, Dr. Claire Oleas will share a bit about the founding days of the Leader Luncheon. We are delighted to be here tonight at Gilborden Public Library, Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, since we are uh, all about history, vaccinated and physically distanced as we come out of the pandemic as a part of Women's History Month to feature some of our own local women's history of the YWCA Leader Luncheon. My assignment is to give you a brief history of the beginnings of the Elgin Leader Luncheon in the context of its being part of a national program nearly 40 years old. I will be mentioning a few names in passing here and many of you will recognize these names, but some may be new. Planning for the first YWCA Leader Luncheon in Elgin began actually in 1983 when Adult Services Director Elaine Pappas Social Services Director Joan Berna nicknamed the $6 million woman because she was so wonderful at writing and getting grants for the YW. And YWCA Board President Jackie Pierce attended a national YWCA conference where this leadership recognition program was being presented for the first time. I was a new YWCA board member at the time, recruited and mentored by the late Barbara geister Belde. Betty Brown, from whom you will hear later, subsequently accompanied Elaine Pappas to check out a Leader Awards program in another city as the Elgin YWCA was defining its event. Each YWCA that participates chooses its own leadership award categories, the number of the awards, and the name for its event. For example, Springfield, Illinois' events named Women's of Excellence Awards. Some have luncheon programs, some are dinner programs, some choose to have a keynote speaker as Elgin did. Here in Elgin, Elaine, Joan, Jackie and their committee recommended to the board six individual awards to be named for outstanding community leaders in their respective categories, as well as de designating a corporate award category. Elgin's first leader luncheon in 1984 started with these six individual award categories, arts, business and professions, communications, education, social service, volunteer community service, and the corporate award. Later, lifetime achievement, racial justice, and public service awards were added. The Communications Award was updated to Communications and Technology, and the Education Award, as Nancy Schooneman referenced, added the name of an, another historically significant educator. Our panelists will be presenting short biographies of these women for whom the awards were named, and in one case, we are honored to have Betty Brown with us for whom the Racial Justice Award is named, instituted in 1997. As the panelists present the biography for which each of the awards is named, you will see a scroll of portraits of the recipients in each award category. These portraits for many years were the gift of interesting developments photography with photographers Molly Conitzer, herself an arts award recipient and her daughter, Kathy Newhaven. Over the decades of the YWCA Leader Luncheon, 234 women have been honored nominated by individuals or organizations. Before we start into the biographies and portraits, a brief word about the keynotes. Chicago Mayor Jane Byrne, the first female mayor of Chicago, was the keynote speaker at Elgin's first leader luncheon held at the Blue Moon Ballroom in 1984. Other notable national keynotes over the years were Janet Guthrie, Indianapolis 500 race car driver, who wowed us all with her insights. And of course, First Lady Barbara Bush in 1991, whose Literacy Foundation had awarded the Elgin YWCA a highly competitive national literacy grant in recognition of its past performance and to have the YWCA continue its great work in literacy. 
We had over 700 attendees at the Seville, not socially distanced, I might add, which had become our new le leader luncheon home, who enjoyed the First Lady's down to earth message. We've had some unique keynotes as well, Dr. Michael Ackerman of the Mayo Clinic on some groundbreaking heart research affecting women and the late Illinois representative Doug Haft who filled in at the last minute for state treasurer Judy Bartopinka and true to representative Haft's great sense of humor, he wore the corsage that leader luncheon chair Karen Fox had ready for him. And we've had some wonderful local keynotes as well. So let's begin with our visual history and I'm gonna turn this over to Myrna Hanseman who will start the award history. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the Marguerite Henry Award for Communications and Technology. Now, all of the stories are very interesting, but I found this one extremely interesting. As Marguerite was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1902, and that she was the youngest of five children. At six years old, she was stricken with rheumatic fever, which kept her bedridden until the age of 12. And while confined indoors, she discovered the joy of reading and her love of animals started during her childhood. Soon afterwards, she was discovered a love of writing when her parents presented her with a writing desk for Christmas. She later said, at last I have a world of my very own, a writing world. And soon it would be populated by all the creatures of my imagination. At six years, at 12 years, 11 years old, she was paid $12, which would be $250 today, for her first novel, Hide and Seek and Autumn Leaves. She often wrote about animals such as dogs, cats, birds, foxes, and mules, but chiefly, she focused on horses. After studying at Milwaukee State Teachers College, she married Sidney Crocker Henry. During their 64 years of marriage, and they didn't have any children, but instead had numerous pets that served as an inspiration for some of Marguerite's stories. It's no wonder that they chose Wayne, Illinois for their home. She went on to work with the illustrator, Will Wesley Dennis, and together they collaborated on 20 books. In her lifetime, she published 20, 60 books. Her most famous one was Misty of Shinkai League, was published in 1947, and it was instant success. In 1961, it was adapted for film, as where Justin Morgan had a horse in 1972. She also had one that went on to have a television adaptation that was the Medicine Hat Stallion. This was interesting. Henry's last book, was Brown Sunshine of Sawdust Valley. It was a 93 page novel published in 1996 when she was 94 years old. Kirkus Reviews called it Vintage Henry, a lighthearted version of the old girl meets horse story. Only this time, the horse was a mule. She died in November 26, 1997 after multiple strokes. And I might add, she was inducted into the Fox Valley Arts Hall of Fame. And if you want to see her plaque, it's hanging in Hammond's auditorium. I'm Donna Anderson, and I have the honor of presenting uh, a little bit about Myrtle Spiegler Gerberding the award for public service. Myrtle was born and raised in Elgin. She was employed first at the Home National Bank and then worked for the city of Elgin for 34 years where she was the first woman to assume the role of city clerk from 1955 to 1967. She designed the flag of the city of Elgin and wrote and illustrated publications on municipal services. She was an officer of the Illinois Association of Music Municipal Clerks, the International Society of Municipal, Cl Municipal Clerks, and she served on a statewide committee in the creation of the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund and was a local representative of the fund. 
She was also a cooperative observer for the National Weather Service for 10 years. In her spare time, she was a member of the First United Methodist Church, member of the Church Women United, the White Collar Girls, Altrusa Club, the Elgin Historical Society, and the YWCA Board of Directors, the YWCA Advisory Board and the Advisory Board of the Endowment Fund. In 1969, she was named Woman, Woman of the Year by the Altrusa Club. She was also a flutist and played with several local orchestras. Myrtle passed away at the age of 100 in December of 2009. And tonight we have Mary Camancho, who was the 2014, won this award, and she's gonna give us an overview of her experience as a winner of the Leader Luncheon Award. Mary? Thank you. I have been volunteering for most of my life. So when I was approached by a highly respected member of the community asking for my community involvement, that she wanted to nominate me for an, an award, I was quite surprised. I have volunteered for the YWCA, but I did not think that I was eligible or that I could even be considered for one of their awards. She asked me to provide a list of my community involvement. And when I did, she gasped to it. <laughs> and I said, oh, did I make a mistake? I, I knew I had done something wrong. She said, no, I just didn't expect to see a two page list with every 85 things on the list. She quickly uh, said, what I want to do is I want to nominate you for the Myrtle S. Gerberding Public Service Award. Then she started asking me questions about when I began to volunteer. And I said, well, I didn't begin to volunteer like the average person volunteers. What happened was when we were little, we lived across the street from the professional building on the uh, Douglas or the Dexter Street side. And my father, Whenever he'd get a phone call from a doctor or anybody that had an office in the professional building, he'd send me over there. He started doing this when I was 10 years old. And there were days when I would say, Dad, I have too much homework. And he'd say, nope, if they need you, you go. And that phrase has stayed with me all my life. And so even when I was offered a position, any job, like the neighborhood housing services, if they need you, you go. And oh, Dad, you know, I have, I like my job, doesn't matter. So throughout the years, I have served on committees and projects both in Chicago and Elgin in the areas of education, housing, cultural history, the arts, government, and others. For example, I have served on eight different committees for the city of Elgin. The one that has been most extensive was the Fire and Police Commission, where I served 19 years. The responsibility of that commission was to review the applications, evaluate the candidates when we did the interviews, and then establish a list for the hiring. Some of the others for the city uh, committees are uh, the Capital Budget Committee and the Human Relations Commission. This is one commission that is very well recognized. As a member of the Mexican Cent Cultural Center in Chicago, I was asked by the Mexican Council to coordinate reading projects, uh, groups of four people or more, but um, at least a hundred people to provide reading classes for them, for the lower level reading groups. So I did establish this. I had a hundred people in my project. At the end of the project, the people were allowed to keep the books that the Mexican consulate had provided. Then in order to uh, give my report, the consul sent me to Mexico to give my report. And I found out that there were only two of us from the United States that participated in this project. There were about 40 or 50 from Mexico and the other from the United States was from Texas. So um, we were recognized there too in Mexico and we were taken on a tour of Mexico City. So this was nice. Some of the other um, things that I've been involved in is um, the Mexican consulate also asked me to uh, 
catalog a collection of Mexican artifacts that were a gift from the wife of the president of Mexico. They had no information, so I really had to do extensive research, do all the, a catalog of the items, and then take it on display. The first place I had it on display was at the Daily Center, and it was so successful that I was able, able to uh, find three more locations where I could display it. We also had a, another local display of artifacts that had been a, a gift from the uh, Rotary Club of Mexico and the Elgin to the Hispanic Fine Arts Council. We had uh, a display of all these artifacts and also I had to do the research on those figures too. And then after that, we had an auction and it was very successful. Hispanic Fine Arts also had a lot of programs at the Hemans. Uh, we sponsored a lot of events. And one of them was uh, Los Lobos. I think everybody knows who Los Lobos are. And Los Lobos became so popular in the Chicago area after we brought them that they came and thanked us. I took them to my mom's house and we had dinner for them. And they called their families from there and were playing my dad's guitar so that they could say they were really here. We also hosted the famous flamenco dance group that is in residence at Northeastern Illinois University under the direction of Dame Libby Comaico. Ms. Comaico has been recognized by the government of Spain for her work with this uh, ballet. She takes time to really uh, research all the costumes and everything that has to do with her group. And that's why they didn't just recognize the group, they also recognized her personally. I also coordinated the filming of Jimmy Hoffa movie in Elgin with Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito and a National Pizza Hut commercial, including the local persons. I have been a longtime volunteer for the Gail Warden Public Library and it's, I still have my library card from second grade. That's how much the library means to me. And the Gifford Park Association housewalk. Throughout my life, I have met and worked with some wonderful people, and I hope this can continue. One last item that I want to tell you about, but I won't do it now because it will take a long time. I also hosted a circus down where the casino parking lot is, and I had to babysit a baby elephant to do publicity for that circus. So I'll tell you about that later. Thank you. I'm gonna talk about Marjorie Leonard for the volunteer community service. <clears throat> Marjorie was born in Lockport, Illinois in 1906. She received a bachelor's degree in English in the twenties from the University of Wisconsin. And there is where she met the man that you'd come her husband, Arthur Leonard. He was a manager for more than 30 years of the JC Penney department store in Elgin. Mrs. Leonard was president of Elgin YWCA Board of Directors from 1962 to 1965. She was past president of the Board of the Larkin Home for Children in Elgin, the PEO Organization Sisterhood Chapter DY, a member of the local chapter of the American Association of University of Women, the Upper Kane County Heart Association, and the First United Methodist Church of Elgin, and also their women's group. She was always a member of the board at Sherman Hospital, Elgin, a board member of Elgin Symphony League, and a charter member of the Fox Valley Music Association. Marjorie also played the piano with a six piano ensemble and throughout her life was a featured solo performer and accompanist. She was a 25 year volunteer for the former Elgin Community Chess, now the United Way, and she was a weekly volunteer for 17 years through her church at the Elgin State Hospital. Mrs. Leonard was active in numerous fundraising drives in the community, including those for United Way and Judson College. 
She received a Woman of the Year Award from Altruza, an Elgin Women's Group, and the Susan B. Anthony Award from the Association, American Association of University Women for her efforts to promote the status of women. Her daughter said, mom felt a deep sense of responsibility to the community and to her family. She also stated that she was a very generous person with her time, talent, and finances. And a person from the First United Methodist Church said, she was a friend and a fellow member of our church. And she was a beautiful person, a true friend. She was an outstanding person. She loved the church, she loved the Lord, and she did so much for the city of Elgin and the surrounding area. Now, I thought I would be at my house tonight, I was gonna say, and if I look out my window, I look at the Marjorie Leonard house, which is still called the Marjorie Leonard house. And we know why she was awarded this honor. And I am up next to present Beatrice Dorsey. And uh, as I'm listening to our other presenters, I'm having a great time watching the scroll of, of pictures. And I do want to also um, acknowledge Ruben Ramos photography who took over the photography of the leader luncheon recipients um, from interesting developments a few years ago. So Beatrice Dorsey, uh, was the owner of B. Dorsey Fashions in West Dundee from 1954 until her retirement in 1984. She was well known for her fashionable ensembles, which were topped off by a hat. Now I've got a B. Dorsey outfit on, which I will model after the pictures finish scrolling for about 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> I'm as part of the bio that I'm reading. I do want to acknowledge it's from a, an article of Paula Lauer from the Chicago Tribune um, shortly after Beatrice Dorsey's uh, death. She died at age 88 in 1992. But um, from the time period of the late 50s until her retirement in 1984, if you were going anywhere and you wanted to be beautifully dressed, you went to be Dorsey for that dress, whether it was a uh, wedding, whether it was the Fidelitor's charity ball, whether it was one of the hospital events or a big organizational event, mother of the bride, you went to be Dorsey's. And B was known not only for dressing people fashionably, she was so very fashionable and uh, wore a hat. In fact, her daughter said if she was going to jewel, she wore a hat. She loved hats. She didn't think an outfit was complete without a hat, not even a bathing suit. To pay tribute to Dorsey, who during her career hosted over 180 fashion shows to benefit local not-for-profit organizations, the Dundee Historical Society put together a display titled A Tribute to Beatrice Dorsey. And the display at the Society's Museum in West Dundee features about 20 of Dorsey's favorite hats dating from the 1920s through the 1980s. B herself was a longtime member of the Historical Society and an outstanding businesswoman. And the Historical Society members thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to honor her, which I certainly agree. Um, that's Beatrice Dorsey. And I'll show you in just a moment her outfit that my mom wore to the 1961 Elgin Country Club dance. It's in the style of a Jackie O'Kennedy Nassus sheath dress with a jacket. So <laughs> 60 years old and going strong. <laughs> today. Um, I'm Betty Brown, and I'm privileged and honored to be here this evening. Um, if many of you may know that the Justice uh, Racial Justice Award was awarded to me, which is a great honor. And I take that honor to every place I think go because I am a dedicated, dedicated woman of the YWCA starting from my teens. I took tap dancing lessons there, music lessons there, and I've always considered the YWCA 
one of my most prominent places to give my time and money. And as you might know, I'm from Elgin all my life. I came to Elgin when I was six years old. My parents were domestic help in Schaumburg. They worked for a very wealthy lawyer and my father was a chauffeur. And I came to Elgin and uh, went to the Elgin schools, graduated from Elgin High School and went on to uh, become a nurse, registered nurse. Then I have an aunt that was very involved in fashion. So everyone thinks I just love fashion and I do. And I was very active in the fashion world also. Dedication to our city has been my most prominent list of things I like to do. From my church, I used to sing. From the cemetery, I would sing. And uh, I would sing at many churches here in Elgin. I love my city. I love the YWCA. And I salute all of the women that were part of making this day. Thank you. Okay, our next award is the Marie Grolick Award for Social Service. From 1937 to 1958, 21 years, Marie was the General Secretary of the YWCA. This title was later changed to Executive Director. She was Camp Director from 1938 to 1944 in addition to her other duties. She was known to the staff and campers at Camp Tewindui as Aunt M. In 1970, the city of Elgin dedicated a Southwest Side Park named in her memory. In 2016-17, this park was updated to be an interactive park. It is now a smartphone interactive playground, which uses a free app to play mobile games designed to get kids active at the playground, renovate a picnic shelter, sand volleyball court, bag games, a paved walking path, in a five station fitness area. And here you're seeing all the women who have won this award over the years. Harriet Gifford joins Hattie Griffin as the second namesake of the YWCA's Individual Award for Education. In the mid 1880s, James Gifford brought his wife, five children, and two spinster sisters, Harriet and Experience, from New York to Elgin. 
On their first Sunday in Elgin, a very determined Harriet insisted on holding a church service in one of the family cabins located on Prairie Street. She took charge of giving the sermon while her uncle, Hezekiah, led the singing. With that same determination, Harriet Gifford began the first school in Elgin in 1838, gathering children in her brother James' cabin for instruction. In 1840, she began what was known as a subscription school in the Union Chapel, charging children five cents a day for classes. It's no wonder that Harriet would be chosen along with Hattie Griffin as the namesake for that YWCA Individual Award for Education. Harriet and her family held strong anti-slavery views, and we suspect that she bravely shared these in her classroom. Although she spoke in favor of under, the Underground Railroad between Elgin and Canada, there are no written accounts of her participation. This is probably because those who harbored slaves were subject to severe criminal penalties. With Elgin's post-World War II population growing and the development of Sunset Park on Elgin's west side becoming the home to families with multiple children, it was decided that a new elementary school would need to be constructed. That school, located on Clifton Avenue, opened in 1949 and bears the name Harriet Gifford. I'm gonna talk about Margaret Hillis Award for the Arts. Most of us know that Margaret Hillis was the conductor of the Elgin Symphony Orchestra from 1971 through 1985. But I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on Margaret. She was born in Kokomo, Indiana in 1921 and she began to study the piano at age five and she played many instruments, including woodwinds, brass, and double bass, brass. And I found it interesting that her first conducting in high school was as assistant conductor of her high school orchestra. After suspending her studies during World War II to become a civilian flight instructor in Muncie, Indiana, Hillis received a Bachelor of Music degree in composition from Indiana University. Later, she went on to Juilliard to study conducting. Now she wanted to be a symphony conductor, but at that time it was male dominated. And so she chose to go into conducting um, chorus. She spent several years in New York where she taught choral conducting and had met, held many prestigious conducting positions. She was recruited to come to Wilmette in 1957 and went on to put together the Chicago Symphony Chorus, which she led for the next 37 years. From there, she had many firsts. She was the first woman to conduct the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, so her dream came true. First woman to conduct Gustav Mahler's Symphony No. 8 in New York's Carnegie Hall. Under her leadership, the Chicago Symphony Chorus performed and recorded many of the major works in the choral symphonic repertoire. She gave important world premieres, appeared with visiting orchestras, and won nine Grammy Awards for best choral performance. Elgin was very excited when Margaret Hillis said she would come and be the conductor, to be our full-time conductor. That was, remember that Deansland was the conductor before this. But one stipulation for her to come was that she asked to have a symphony league. And that was when our Elgin Symphony League was formed. She saw the value in having an organization be a support group for the symphony. And under her leadership, ESO grew and made historic strides in the reputation as a nationally acclaimed orchestra. 
Margaret Hillis died in 1998, just a few weeks before the 200-member two, Chicago Symphony Chorus was to celebrate its 40th anniversary. Hillis was 76 years old when she died at Evanston Hospital of complications of lung cancer. She also was selected in the Fox Valley Arts Hall of Fame and you can view her award also in the Hammonds Auditorium. with the easy way. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was wondering, Mary, what did it mean to you to win the award? How, how did that, how, you explained it once to me and I thought it was beautiful. So you're on mute. <laughs> She's on mute. Well, she, Mary's on mute for a minute, so um, we're going to get her off mute and let her explain that to you, uh, give you a little recap of it. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to really um, talk about some of the programmings at the wide up but there. Mary is off mute, so hey, Mary. What did, what did it really mean to you? The YWCA has always meant a lot to us, to Mark family. Uh, when we were little, we used to go swimming in the pool. We used to do a lot of things. We used to volunteer. We used to take children that were not members of our family or not related. We used to take them to the YWCA because it was a good place for them to grow. We would volunteer with any educational things, even when we were little. And so when all of a sudden somebody tells me that I deserve an award from this organization, I kept thinking, what, what did I do? I mean, I, I never, I don't deserve it. And, and uh, she said, yes, you do, yes, you do. <laughs> and uh, it was Carol Rauschenberger, the one that nominated me. And uh, I, I know Carol, but I didn't know her well enough to say I expected her to do that, you know but it, it really has meant a lot to me and to my family. I always, I always thought that was pretty special, that story and what Betty has shared with me has always been in my heart, uh, probably kept me here in Elgin because I admired you all so very much. In this room, we have a lot of winners, women who keep giving to the YWCA, and we really appreciate it, um, especially taking the time, Claire, to help with this program. And Nancy, you both were fantastic. Donna, she's always great. So, <laughs> and Myrna is wonderful. So, we're, we're very lucky at the YWCA, and we've been leading the way for programs that empower women and children and families for almost 120 years. Our current YWCA programs include, and these are broad categories, adult education, family literacy, school-age child care, take to creative camp, and more. We have citizenship class, clothing closet. We could just go on for probably an hour, but I won't because the ladies will throw stuff at me here. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, feel free to call me at the YWCA to find out more about the programs we offer. It's not so much a gym as it is more social service. And I want to give the very thank you so much to Nancy, Claire, Betty, Donna, 
Mary and Myrna for inspiring me to work harder. Um, just like they have all the women in this community. So we really appreciate that. Um, does anybody have anything else I'd like to add? Well, I would like to ask Nancy Schooneman, without putting her on the spot, to recap what's happening with this year's Leader Lunch and Time. Um, because of the pandemic, our um, in-person luncheon was canceled last year, and I think we have held over um, the people who were selected last year for this year. So I'm going to mute myself and let Nancy get on here and talk about that a little bit and maybe some sponsorship things, too. Absolutely, Claire. Thank you. Yes, um, as I think I mentioned in the very beginning, this year's YWCA Leader Luncheon will be held virtually, like so many events are right now, on uh, Thursday, May 13th at 6 o'clock p.m. And there's absolutely no charge for this. I know several organizations charge an admittance fee and you have to get a code to go on, but that's not going to happen. Um, the event is going to be entirely free. Um, just go to our website at the YWCA and, and um, it will just um, take you through what you need to do to be part of that event that evening. It will go from six to about 7.30. And yes, we have our nominees, um, our ladies were nominated in 2020, but we held them over until 2021 so that we could better honor them um, in each of the categories. And I think right now we're at 28 different nominees. So you'll be um, learning more about them and seeing who the recipients are um, at that time. We also have a variety of different sponsorships. As always, we have our leader circles, um, which is a charge of uh, $1,250. And um, um, if, you're, if you're interested in donating to the Y, wow, we would love to see that. Um, we also have different uh, other different levels. We have gold star donors, silver star donors, and circle of friends. And um, that information too is all on the website. But um, of course, the YW has been going through some difficult times during the past year during COVID and their doors have always remained open with vital services, everything from handing out diapers to continuing um, ESL classes online to providing childcare and, and support when children um, are having difficulties getting online for classes come to the Y and they'll, they'll, they'll straighten that out and help you with that. If you need a Chromebook, come to the YW and um, our teachers are there to, to help you with that as well. So as I say, our doors have remained open, but we do need some help. We need your support um, and financial backing as always. I feel like Julia Peck, I'm just not riding my horse up and down the street <laughs> <laughs> looking for donations, but um, I do get on the phone every once in a while. So um, I, uh, uh, we would appreciate anything that anyone can do. And I thank you for that. Julia, if we could, I'd like to take just a moment uh, to talk about what the YWCA is doing in its programming as far as both STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and STEAM, with adding in the arts, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And one of the um, interesting programs I found just fascinating is the, the Take Two Camp because that involves um, many of those elements. And um, I'm going to mute myself. Can you let people know how people can sign up for the Take Two Camp? Well, we're pretty excited about the Take Two Camp. Each summer, we have about 30 to 40 teens participating in it. And we're luckily funded by Elgin Township for it each year. And they um, it all happened because we had a Mac computer that you could edit on. And out of that grew this whole program that kids don't have access to computers at home. And they don't have access to uh, photography equipment. And we had that. So we decided to make a program from a 
few of those items with the very talented Carissa. And uh, it is uh, really about you write a script, you produce the script, you, uh, they do everything from earning money to go on field trips uh, because we don't have a lot of money. Sometimes they have to earn it. You might see a sidewalk sale in front of the YWCA and it's usually them. So they, they collect for it. Um, and these kids just get together and work in groups and produce like <laughs> they did a take of the Golden Girls. Now I am a Golden Girls fan because I think it's really me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, they, it was really fun to watch that. And we could, we did do our red carpet this year. And uh, we have a red carpet event after the season. Um, and it's six weeks in the summer. And uh, they, we did it virtual. And it, it went off very well. There's singing, there's editing, there's figuring out how to make it work and there's a science to it that I that's not my forte right now I'm trying to learn elevator science <laughs> and um so the kids have been wonderful and they beg to come back every year and there's this cutoff point at 10th grade which makes me kind of sad and we're hoping to do a more college prep prep program starting in their junior and senior year. Um, I haven't got it funded, but I will. I, I, we will find a way to get it funded. Um, it's because you can't waste time. Every minute you have to be helping kids get to where we want it to be, or at least me. <laughs> and most of them have surpassed me. They are so great and, um, it's so much fun we do cooking as another way because all the measurements you do in cooking, you don't even realize you're, you're learning about science, uh, math at that time. Uh, we do a lot of that uh, extra stuff and the Creative Two, um, Take Two Creative Camp has been one of the best programs in the summer for teens. And you can register online probably starting in the at the end of april and we'll call get the application and you'll be in so uh there's no charge and somebody is just counting away i'm going way too long so uh but thank you claire we do do some it's so important and steam <laughs> which i find that hilarious So, okay, I'll say goodbye. So <laughs> they are cueing me. So again, thank you ladies for being here tonight. And I really appreciate all the changes we made at the last minute and come to the YWCA any, well, kind of come to the YWCA as soon as all the restrictions are li lifted and see the wonderful things like the desks that were made for the kids in sack from a family and donated the Mead family. Uh, the many donations that we've gotten and help to get our kids through this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, ladies. Bye. I'm supposed to wave bye now. That's what that means. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye.